Well, I think the primary difference between writing fiction and writing journalism, for instance, is that rather than writing about topics or trends or fashions, a novelist writes about people. And I ha often have a focus on a family. The family unit to me is like the nexus of all emotion, and people derive their, their meaning from the position in families and maybe in neighborhoods and villages and towns. So I think of people enmeshed in a social situation. And to those people, things happen in life. It might be violent. It might be some catastrophic event that happens. It could be something that's politically relevant. It could be a racist experience. But all these experiences happen to people. And very often in the context of a family and dealing with family uh, relations. So as a storyteller, I put my faith in people. M most writers and poets, I think, focus on the microcosm. The microcosm is taking a small sample of life and focusing on that, seeing the universe in a droplet of, of uh, a, ra a raindrop, you know, seeing the, this influence. I think that looking at specific people who are representative maybe of the time and place is a way that novelists have always made universal statements. So we tend to write about people who are very specific and even idiosyncratic sometimes, but they really represent something beyond themselves and have this sort of universality. I think I became interested in the subject of how girls, of course, become women and how children who are girls are kind of conditioned to be essentially feminine and female and how different that is from how boys are conditioned to, to grow into men. And we see that the, the, there is a power dynamic there that a little girl is rewarded when she's feminine and soft and docile and placating and, and passive. And a boy is more admired when he's kind of feisty and mischievous and he can get in trouble and it's considered like he's a boy and then he becomes a man and, and it kind of exudes that air of masculinity. And so I've, I really uh, have found it fascinating to focus on girls who are about 14 years old, kind of at the beginning of puberty and how they lose their childlikeness, which can all be almost like a neutrality, like a little girl is not necessarily feminine or masculine. She could just be a child, you know. There's a kind of wonderful neutrality of childhood that gets conditioned out when girls get to be 12, 13 years old, 14 years old. And then from that point on, when they're so shaped by what we call the male gaze and the expectations of others that they grow, they grow into being someone who is this female image. And so for some women, it's probably not a great tragedy. But for other women who, in fact, like Karen Blixen, I was visiting the Karen Blixen estate um, just this morning, you know, Karen Blixen said, very, she's just made it very, very explicit and kind of wonderful that she found it really, really difficult to identify with having to be this daughter of a well, a well-to-do landowner who would then marry a rich man and be in that whole a sort of cycle of the, the daughter of the rich man who gets married to another rich man and sort of has children and continues continue that cycle. So Karen Blixen, who, be, who writes under the pseudonym Isaac Dennison, she really broke that mold. It was uh, quite courageous, because this is some time ago. She broke the mold and for some, in some ways it was tragic and difficult for her. But overall, the trajectory of her life was very triumphant. Well, families are microcosms, too, like of the, of the culture at large. And it's always been the case that often mothers are the ones who, who nurture the, the girl. And it's actually the mother who guides the girl into becoming this uh, replica of herself traditionally. That you're, you're in the world, and if you have a, a religious significance, that you're in the world to have babies and basically carry on and, and reproduce the species. And it has to be done in this sort of patriarchal uh, roof where you know your place and 
the husband's the breadwinner and, and he knows his place. So traditionally the family has been the, the mold that the, that the child I put into. But today the family is very different and there are all kinds of families today. There are families of, of same-sex couples who've gotten married and they might adopt a child or, or they may have a child of their own, but then there may be families that are like communes where people are living in sharing a house together, but they are actually a family. And they may have dogs and cats, you know, who are like their children. Uh, they may have a communal garden and, and make a little a living that way. The, the, the so-called nuclear family, which is just father and mother and, and children, the nuclear family still exists, of course, but it's not the only uh, exemplum any longer, which is really wonderful. It, it all begins with the eman emancipation of women, I think with the birth control pill in the 19, late 1950s or 1960s because women then could control contraception as they couldn't before. So a woman could elect to have children, and the children that the women would have would be cho chosen freely, and they wanted to have children, rather than have nine or 10 or 15 children that were sort of foisted upon them. So it really began, I think, in the mid 20th century where women were allowed to have much more agency over their bodies, and then they were also allowed much more to go to college and universities and law school and medical school. It used to be very difficult for a woman to go to law school, medical school. The quotas were really small. Now, I believe there are over 50% of women in American medical schools. I don't know what the statistics are, but I think it's over 50%, which is just astonishing. I have a novel called Missing Man, and it's really like a valentine to my own mother, who was kind of an old-fashioned mother. She did not have a career. She did not get, she wasn't educated beyond the eighth grade. She dropped out to, to uh, help work at home. We, we, she lived on a farm with her, with her parents. Later, after I was born, after my mother was married and I was, I was born, we came to live on that farm. So we had a multi-generational family unit, which I didn't mention a minute ago. The multi-generational family unit is also something that's very traditional. You have grandparents and parents and children. I suppose you could even have great-grandchildren kind of living all in one large house. Farm, farm life was often like that, where you have a lot of people working, and the children had their work to do on the farm. And so the mother was uh, very, very central. Missing a mom, the title really meant that, I'm, that we miss our mothers when we grow up. Our mothers may die. We miss our mothers. But also the idea that we're missing the mother, we're missing her because we didn't understand that she was a person. She wasn't just mother. She had her own identity before we were born. And so the character in my novel gets to know her mother after her mother has died. She gets to know her mother through photographs and, and reading about her and, and, and talking to people about her mother. And she realizes that she actually didn't know her mother that well. She only knew the woman who was her mother. She didn't know this, this other woman. And I felt that way about my own mother, that she had had a, a complicated, difficult life before I came along. And, I sometimes like to write about people in my family whom I didn't know. They were extremely courageous, and they lived through the Great Depression. They came to America as immigrants, and they, they, they had nothing. Like, they had no money. They couldn't speak English. <laughs> so it was like a way of life I found very courageous. Well, in my novel, Babysitter, Hannah is the protagonist, and though she doesn't represent all women, she does represent a certain segment of women who are not career people. They, she doesn't have a career. She's more or less the daughter of her father, who was somebody who focused a lot on the physical appearance. He thought that people made impressions on one another and that we're in the world more or less to manipulate other people. And so he wanted his daughter to be very physically attractive and to dr always dress very well. So Hannah has these principles which some women have, I've actually known women like this, they always buy the most expensive clothes because they are so insecure that they feel that if they have the most expensive clothes, then they can't be criticized. Whereas somebody who is much more secure could run around, you know, in, 
in in torn jeans, you know, and an over like a pullover shirt or something, but they're always really dressed with designer labels. That's very important. And they have fancy handbags that are very expensive. And their hair is always uh, styled in a certain way that's perfect and it could be colored or bleached or something. And then they may have cosmetic surgery and everything about them is faultless. So when they leave their bedrooms and go out into the world, they're literally playing a role, a little bit like a movie actress. They're going out with the cosmetic mask and all this paraphernalia. And even the jewelry that they wear would be very selected, like a real, a real diamond and something that's really like a real ruby and things that are very expensive. So my character, Hannah, is sort of all put together with these different parts, and she is a mother, and her children sort of pull at her. They, at one point in the novel, they're hugging her legs, you know, and they, they, they adore their mother, but they don't have any idea who she is, and she feels very lonely just being only a mother because she's nice to them. She's only the mother that feeds them and takes care of them. Then her, her husband, she's the wife, and he married her at a time when they were both young and, and kind of yearning for love. But now he's very successful as a, a businessman, an executive, and he, he doesn't really need his wife any longer. He goes on business trips, and it's possible that he has escorts or he meets women, beautiful women when he's traveling. She, Hannah doesn't really know what he's doing, and it's not all that clear. And then she has an identity with other women in her culture, a sort of an upper middle class society where women like her belong to the country club, exclusive clubs, and have lunch together. And they're all there because they are the wives of these executives. A babysitter takes place in the area outside Detroit where the automobile executives live, uh, General Motors and Ford's executives. And they're like, they could be like royalty and uh, oligar they're oligarchs in American life and they're sort of like royalty and they have the biggest houses and they have gate gates that you can't get in, like gated communities. So it's almost like a feudal America and some people aspire to get into that world. But if you're in that world, you feel like you're kind of trapped in it. So Hannah has an experience where she's sort of knocked out of that, she's jolted out of that stereotype that she's in and she's sort of like just this person and she has this erotic experience with a man kind of outside all these identities he doesn't really have any he pretends he doesn't have any interest in her life but really we learn later on in the novel that he's actually manipulating her he knows who her husband is and he has a definite plan and a pattern using her but she's so naive she doesn't know that but one of the reasons that I like to write, which uh, almost never comes out in, in a discussion or questions that ask me, <clears throat> writing is storytelling. Um, what's interesting about storytelling is that you have to have revelations, that you start off with a situation and a little bit of a mystery evolves, and then you have to follow the tendrils and the roots of that mystery like an investigator, and then there has to be a revelation. So I focus a lot in my writing on the pacing and the suspense and the movement, like how long is a paragraph, you know, how short is the dialogue and how much dialogue is there in proportion to the exposition. And these are the, the craftsman side of writing is actually why many people write. You know, it's like if you're a painter, you, you like to paint. You even like the smell of the paint, you like the color, and you're sort of creating your own paints. Real painters, I think, mix their own paints. They mix their own colors. It's something that's just very sensuous and pleasurable. But then when people talk about the painting, they talk about something like the, the theme or the, the actual picture, and that's not really why the people are writing. So when I'm writing about Hannah, I'm, I'm creating a character who's a little bit like an actress and she's in, in a movie. And then I'm focusing on how, how does she move through scenes and we see her, then we see her this way and we see her that way. And then she gets some dialogue and um, I try to give her this sort of exciting dialogue. So for me, one of those exciting parts of the novel was 
She see Hannah sees her lover taking her son into this men's laboratory in this really kind of seedy, rundown park, and it seems that maybe there's some illicit behavior going on in there. It could be all sorts of things. And she suddenly realizes that she has to get her son back. So she, she pulls her son away from that man, and in that moment she exerts herself as the mother. She really is a mother when it comes down to it. She is responsible for that child. And it doesn't matter if it's a stereotype or a cliche. She has mm -hmm. to take care of him. Mm -hmm. So when she pulls him away from her lover, that's like the end. That is going to be the end of her being enthralled to the, to the lover. And from that point on in the novel, she's really independent of him. And I, I found that to, to write that, to imagine it and writing it, I found it very exciting because to me, I'd like to think that I could act that way. You know, you just suddenly, oh, I'm gonna do something. She literally does something. And then they drive away. And then after that, he's like her enemy. The lover's like her enemy. But now she knows that they're gonna be, she understands much more of the situation. Well, I spent a lot of my time in preparation for, for writing by, by running and walking. So when I'm running, I try to see a little movie in my head of the scene I'm going to write. So I'm kind of identifying with the character. And the revelation that we sometimes have about ourselves comes in an emergency, like a sudden emergency situation. Some people discover that they're extremely courageous. I mean, there have been men who've actually lifted cars. <laughs> They've, you know, almost broken, broke their backs. Or somebody discovers that they dive into the river to save somebody. And um, one minute they're walking on the bank of the river, the next minute they're in the water pulling somebody out. And I think that's just so extraordinary about people that we suddenly rise to an occasion. I think most people do, actually. And if it's a matter of a child, or maybe if somebody was helpless, you know, you sort of, even though you don't know who they are and maybe you don't even care who they are, you just suddenly, something human comes along. In Night, Sleep, Death and the Stars, the children of, of Joc Jocelyn, the, the mother who's a widow, the children, the, the, they're adult grown up children. They keep saying, well, mother, our mother doesn't do that. Oh, this man is making her go out in a canoe. Well, our mom doesn't do that. Or he's making mom drive the car. Well, daddy always drove the car. Mom didn't do it. And people are always sort of saying that within a family, like, oh, that's not what, that's not you. You're not, you're not really doing that. That's not right, you know. It's a way that you're controlling people. And especially adult children get very crazy if they're widowed mother or father starts seeing somebody else, they, they just get kind of crazy and behave like children sometimes. Instead of seeing that, say, uh, when a ma if man loses his wife, sometimes a man really is lost and almost just needs to get married again. And the children just go crazy because they say, well, you know, mom hasn't been gone for a year yet and you're already seeing other women. It's just this attempt to pull people down to what they have been rather than allowing them to kind of grow into the next level. I mean, I agree, it could be upsetting for adult children to see the parents behaving like teenagers or you know, falling in love or something. But for the adult, the person who's the widow or widower, that's like a new, a new hope, you know, rather than crying or lying in bed and being depressed, to kind of have this uh, emotional experience is, is better than, much better than nothing. Mm -hmm. Well, in Night, Sleep, Death, and the Stars, when a father dies, he's a very patriarchal, sort of old-fashioned, powerful father, but loving, and he's actually a very nice man, very generous father. He dies, and then the five children have to sort of redefine themselves, and his widow's devastated. She really is extremely broken, and she is not a career woman, she is suicidal for a while. She lets herself go. She gives away a lot of her clothing. She's really, really broken. She's even let, letting, like, the, the grass is growing, you know, everything is getting kind of shabby around the house. 
Now, by accident, she meets a man. She doesn't necessarily intend to meet a man, but he sees her. He's taking photographs, and he sees her at the graveside of her husband, and she's sort of like a figure where she's sort of seen from the back, and he takes her photograph. Then later on, they meet, and he... he is very exuberant. He's a person who is a, he's a creator, like he's a photographer and he loves life. And he's very exuberant. He has a mustache and he dresses in a certain way. Now, the, the fact is that, that he's Hispanic is almost irrelevant. It's like his character type. He's very exuberant. Now, when he plays piano, if he makes a mistake, he just keeps on playing. And he, you know, if you know how to play, you cover up your mistakes. Whereas when Jocelyn played piano, if she makes a mistake, she does it over again, you know. That's the sort of way I would play piano. You know, I play the piano, oops, I made a mistake, I'll do it over again. But not, not with Hugo, he's just sort of playing the piano. And she looks at him and she just feels that's so wonderful that he can do that. It's like his character is the opposite of her character. And the fact that he is Hispanic is really irrelevant. But then when her children see him, that's what they see. Like they say, oh my God, mom is going, mom is seeing uh, a Hispanic man or a Cuban man or, or he's Puerto Rican or something. They, they have all these cliches that come out. And I, I think they're very funny. I meant a lot of their dialogue to be very funny. The two sisters are talking about the mother. Just, have you heard what mom is doing? But mother doesn't do that, you know? That at one point Hugo says to the mother and, and to one of her sons, they've never traveled anywhere. So, well, come with me. We can go to South America. And they're stunned. Like, oh, you can go to South America? Like, these are people who haven't done that. But Hugo comes in and says, Hugo says, well, let's go to the south of France, you know. Um, we, how would you like to go to to Israel, how it's like to go to China. And suddenly it's like a whole new idea. Well, the children say, well, no, mom, mom doesn't want to travel. She wants to stay home. And, but turns out that the mother does travel. She, she thinks she doesn't want to, like she'll never, leave, she'll never leave home. But then she winds up at the end of the novel, she's out. <laughs> She's going, she's at the Galapagos, you know, in about South America, which is where I ended up with my, my second husband. We went to the Galapagos Islands uh, off the coast of Ecuador. And I mean, I never ever in my life wanted to go to the Galapagos Islands and I didn't want to go to Ecuador where I got all altitude sickness, you know. And what's so exciting, I think, about the novel is that it mimics life and that you end up doing something you never thought you would do because you met somebody who pulled you out of the groove that you were in and you never really wanted to meet that person. It just was totally accidental. So I think life is just wonderful that way. Life is full of surprises. Admittedly, some of them are bad, but some of them are good. And it's a matter of going out into the world and meeting people and being open to these changes. Because I know just as many people who would stay home as a widow and never go out, you know, or, or lie in bed and just be, be suicidal. My novels usually, and on a slight, uh, somewhat upbeat note, uh, my novels often take a turn where toward the end, some younger person comes forward or something happens that's surprising. Like in Babysitter, there's a young man who's only in his 20s named Mikey. And he's what we would call a street kid. He's uh, not educated. He's into drugs and he does other things that are not really, uh, not really legal. He's kind of a hustler. And because so much is going on in his world that's really depraved and really ugly, he comes forward almost like a vigilante. And he does something that brings justice in a weird way. It's not legal. It's what we call vigilante justice. He's the one who kills the serial killer. He kills babysitter. Uh, but I shouldn't actually be giving away the novel because <laughs> you're not supposed to know that until the novel's over. 
Well, in Night Sleep, Death the Stars, which is really a family novel about confronting death and moving on after losing somebody, the precipitating factor is an accidental meeting where of the father who's a man in his 60s, he's uh, not in absolutely A plus condition, but he's he stops at the side of the road because he sees that a young dark-skinned person, he thinks might be a black man, is being harassed by two police officers. And so he just stops his car because he used to be mayor of the city and he just feels this kind of um, responsibility for kind of civic responsibility. So he stops his car and he asks the police officers what they're doing and they react very negatively to him. They don't recognize, they don't know who he was, uh, they don't remember that he was mayor of the city. They just see somebody interfering with them. So they had stopped a young Indian American intern at a, a hospital, actually a doctor, because he's dark skinned and he was driving a nice car. And this sometimes happens in the United States. Uh, a man who's dark skinned, a black man, driving a, an expensive car sometimes is what we call profiled by the police. They pull him over because they are, I guess, jealous. They pretend that they think the car is stolen and they harass this man. Sometimes it ends just with giving him a ticket. Sometimes it ends with him getting killed because they keep escalating and they make him come out of the car and uh, it, it's very well known as a certain scenario where the white police officers keep goading the person till finally he, you know, he, he starts to defend himself and then they, then, then they, then they shoot him. Or sometimes they, he runs away and they shoot him. So it's a situation like that, which I wanted to show could happen to a white person too. That if you're white, it doesn't mean that the police are going to treat you that well, so you shouldn't protect those police. So because he's beaten, he has a stroke, and then eventually he dies, and then all the children are affected and the wife is affected. So the issue of, of racism comes home to a, an upper middle class white family, otherwise impervious. Like, and then Jessalyn learns about, she goes to a meeting, she learns that there have been all these different people who had been victimized by the police. Her husband was one of them, and there are all these others, and she's literally stunned. Now, I lived in Detroit at the time of the civic disturbance, the, the disturbances in Detroit, and I, um, like all the white people in Detroit, I really had no idea of how residents of the inner city were being harassed by the white police officers, you know. Not just one night of the, of the year in July 1967, but for decades, you know, this goes on like every night. And then finally, somebody in the black neighborhood fights back and then they, the police shoot and then somebody else shoots. And suddenly there's uh, what, what the journalists call a race riot, you know, which it's not a, it's not a race riot at all. It's something very different. Uh, the, be the best term is civic disturbance, where the inhabitants of part of the city are rising up against the police officers. But when I lived in Detroit at that time, I didn't know any of that. I had to read about it like 20 years later. Uh, historians write books about things that happen. When we're alive, we don't, when we live through an experience, we don't really know what it is. You know, 20 years from now, if we read about our life now, we're learning much more. Like the whole, the phenomenon of Donald Trump in the United States is very much um, connected with organized crime. Trump himself was organ is connected with organized crime, but that's kind of always beneath the surface and it's not really investigated. But in decades to come, historians are going to know, they have much more information. And it will be very interesting to see Trump's connections with like Putin, his connection with the mob in New York City, his connections with other, you know, criminals and so forth. Uh, it comes to the surface a little bit now and then in the media now, but uh, mostly, mostly it's not really known to the average person.